It is now my pleasure to introduce the moderator of this evening uh, panel discussion, um, which, as we mentioned, is titled No Fixed Address, Art as an Advocacy Tool for the Homeless, Bill McAllister. So William McAllister is a, a researcher and a professor at Columbia University who studies the lives of homeless people and the effects that policies and programs have on their lives. He's also director of the Mellon Interdisciplinary Fellows Program. And a major current research interest now is using structured methods to study the temporal structures of people's lives. In this vein, he has studied the effects of a homeless intervention program on the subsequent housing history of formerly homeless men. Also, the temporal structure of homeless shelter use in New York City and the recruitment structure of the major administrative and political organization of the UN U.S. national state. So it's my great pleasure to present uh, Bill McAllister. Thank you. I spoke here, and then I'll go sit down. Maybe. Yes. Oh, I'm switching up on Michaela here, so, so I've, I've confused her. Sorry. Um, um, uh, uh, thank you very much for that introduction, Michaela. And it's actually um, a really great pleasure to be doing this at SVA. Uh, my wife graduated from here uh, 40 years ago. Um, so, um, so it's a, a pleasure. Uh, she could not be here tonight, but um, it's a great pleasure for me to be doing this uh, forum here. Um, uh, what uh, we thought to do is that um, first to, uh, to in, uh, have the members of the panel introduce themselves to you, and then I'll say a few words about the format, which is to try and get a conversation going among the panelists and between you and the panelists, kind of, you know, so it's not just, uh, you know, we're up here talking heads and then we do a Q&A afterwards. It would be a, kind of, we thought it would be much better to, um, to uh, kind of have more interactive. Can people in the back hear me, by the way? Is that okay? Yeah. Um, okay, and it's gonna be a little warm in here. Um, so uh, I hope you can deal. Um, so John, do you wanna introduce yourself? Sure, uh, my name is John Leo. How are y'all doing tonight? <laughs> good, good. Um, I work with Theater of the Oppressed NYC. I'm a founding member and a facilitator with that organization and uh, what Theater of the Press NYC does is it partners with, or, with uh, communities facing discrimination to make plays uh, about their real life experiences of oppression, present that to an audience, and the audience basically uh, watches that, gets up on stage at the end to try to create new solutions, new alternatives to what's going on for the characters on stage. Um, the first time I saw one of the plays, uh, I was an actor and I went to see one of the plays and I w got really angry about what I saw on stage. It, it was, a, it was a, a show about, um, it was a show about the shelters and sort of the, 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 the violence that goes on in the shelters, how it's not very safe in that environment, things get stolen, people get kicked out and I got really angry and at the end, yeah, I wanted to get up on stage and try to do an intervention to try to change the situation from within. And I got up on stage and I was terrified. Uh, I'm, I'm an actor and everything and I'm pretty used, used to being on stage, but then I got up on stage and I was completely terrified. I, I, I couldn't uh, see anything, I couldn't hear anything. I was just like <clears throat> confused. And I look, I look across the way and I see one of the actors who is a person who's experienced homelessness and, and and I, I look over there and, and I'm like, oh no, they're, they're, it's, a, it's a homeless person and I'm on stage with them and oh, I've never interacted with them before. And he just gave me this look, like, it's gonna be okay. Like he could see that I was like nervous and he's like, this sort of looked like we got this together. And I did something, I can't remember what I did, it failed miserably, it was, we are, uh, and it didn't, yeah, I was trying to be nice. I was trying to go get up on stage and just be nice and that was gonna solve things. And it failed, it flopped. Uh, but I joined the organization and, and put my energies towards that um, as a way to um, sort of change my own views about things, uh, about the world. Uh, for me, it's not about helping. It's about creating solidarity. It's about educating the audience and creating a sense of this is not just 
the, the, these people's problems, this is all of our problem. Uh, so that's a brief introduction to Theory of the Press NYC, and we'll go a little bit into it later, but um, uh, I also want to talk about legislative theater, which is our, what we're, the next step of this interactive theater that we do. Um, we invite city council people to our shows these days, and we have a, the a legislative theater festival, and we, we, invite legislative, uh, we invite city council people, and we brainstorm these solutions with the audience, and then the audience goes, ooh, I like what that person did, I like what that person did, how can we create new policies to change these things? And then the policy people um, talk with each other and propose policy that could affect the situation. And then they go back to the, city, the, the chambers and propose these things. And we're in talks with actually doing theory of the press in the chambers as a, as a tool to uh, affect change. Right. And, we'll, and uh, if you can bring those back uh, further uh, later on in the discussion, yeah. because we'll be touching on exactly those, those, those points. Yeah, yeah. Maji? Yes, greetings everyone. My name is Majid and um, peace and blessings to all. Um, I'm 45 years old and I used to live in Harlem and I used to work at the Apollo and life was great. And then for some reason, my rent got increased. And once my rent got increased, my salary stood the same. So I had the unfortunate experience of being homeless and living in my car. I had a car and I lived in it. And I <clears throat> embarked this journey because, you know, I just didn't want to be a, a, a criminal to go get the rent money, you know? I'd rather be homeless than to lie, steal, and cheat. So that was my, my whole journey right there. And I ended up being in the, in, in the street, living in my car. I was parked on 109 and, um, I was parked on 109 and Fifth Avenue because there was a, sh a shower, a, a public shower there. And while I was using the public showers, they had pantries, you know. Uh, I believe breakfast was at 8, shower was at 9, and laundry was at 10. So I was in the facility. I met a lot of people. We exchanged information, and I came across this gentleman called Phil Hunter who was already involved, a member of Theater of the Oppressed. And he showed me where to get clothes, where to get food, and also how to have an outlet to express myself as an artist. So I went to the rehearsals with Theater of the Oppressed. I met Katie Rubin, and she introduced these theater games. And at that moment, I realized that, you know what? Um, yes, I was going through a, a hardship experience, a very embarrassing experience, something that my parents, my friends, no one knew that I was going through. But uh, with these theater games, the pressure was off me, and I felt more positive in this negative situation that I was going through. The uh, Theater of the Oppressed you know, helped me out because they would ask me questions like, how are you, Maji? And I was able to be real with them about my real situation. And we took these situations and we performed them on stage. And the magic about Theater of the Oppressed is that, you know, I get to perform in front of doctors, police officers, teachers, people that impacted my life in a negative and a positive way. I get to perform my experience in front of them and watch them come up on stage and see how they could create a solution. So being with Theater of the Oppressed for two years now has allow me to be a responsible and positive, productive person in the community. As I was going through these negative, I was an outlaw. Nobody knew my problems, my troubles. I was invisible. I didn't know how, I, how, how to fit in. You know, when I'm taking showers in a public bathroom and on the weekends I had to take, you know, bird baths in, in the Central Park in their bathrooms and watching people come in and watch me brush my teeth and they're staring at me and I'm like, I was invisible. But with Theater of the Oppressed, it gave me the opportunity to become like a positive person, being productive, you know? I felt like I was part of something. I wasn't an outlaw anymore. I was contributing, I was collaborating. And, you know, 
living in the street, you know, uh, could really take, it, take your whole mind. You could lose your mind. You really can lose your mind. You're like, what am I doing living in the street? And you could, you know, choose drugs and you choose crime. It's so easy to just, you know, uh, get caught up. But that shower to me meant integrity, discipline, and that shower was like a million dollar check. So with that shower, I would um, felt I felt confident, confident enough to go and meet up with Theater of the Oppressed every Wednesday, go to my shows, meet professional people, and not feel like a low life. You know what I mean? I felt like you know what? I may not have a home. Yes, I'm living in a car, but still, I'm taking, I'm being responsible still with the story that I'm carrying. Maji, could you could, could I, I'd like to just move on, yes. uh, and and bring more of that back in yes. in our discussion, okay? Thank you, Susan. I mean, I'm fascinated, but <laughs> hi, uh, I'm Susan Crane. I'm the director of community programs at New York Cares. Uh, New York Cares is a volunteer management organization. You might know us best, uh, actually, starting today, um, the Shivering Statue of Liberty uh, coat drive that we do annually every year. Um, <clears throat> so. The two ways that we work with the homeless are, I mean, primarily we are recruiting volunteers to help other non-for-profits meet their mission across New York City. Um, that's kind of the overall mission. The way that we work with the homeless is two ways. One is provide basically manpower to serve critical needs. Um, so doing service in soup kitchens, pantries, et cetera. The other way that we work with the homeless is primarily through children who are living in the shelter system, whether it's private shelters or city-owned shelters, um, and uh, doing arts programs with them. So we have photography and theater and dance and you know very basic arts and crafts, crafts with the children uh, who are living in these shelters. And the idea behind that programming is to really provide the children a way to express their situation and what's going on in their lives, but then also to create kind of a safe space for them, um, a place where they can actually just be kids and not have to worry about any stigma they may feel because of their living situation at the time. Um, and many of the volunteers often tell us that <clears throat> You know, the, the children first start out and they're very quiet and they really don't want to talk to anyone. And as they spend more and more time with the volunteers in the program doing the, um, the curriculum that we have set up, whatever it is, eventually they become much more engaged in the program and they're more interested in interacting with other people and other children in a way that, you know, they're not fighting, they're not acting out, they're just there to, you know, do whatever activity we have there and they look forward to it and if for some reason we can't be there we definitely <coughs> hear about it um, because they're like where am i where are my friends where are my volunteers so that's how we work with the, the homeless right now great so my name is heidi schmidt i'm from the department of homeless services we currently have about 254 shelters across the city and i'm sure there's one in your neighborhood if you know it or not i hope you don't know it um, that means it's well run it's functioning well. Um, they provide social services, so all kinds of support in terms of um, drug rehabilitation, substance abuse, employment seeking, um, housing assistance, um, and we also work with with New York Cares mm -hmm. um, and a variety of other nonprofit organizations, corporations. I have someone here from Free Arts NYC um, that we. It's an obviously an arts organization that we partner with. Um, and our kids go on a regular basis to programs, on, usually on the weekends, sometimes during the school week um, when they have a day off. The kids, I think we can talk more about it a little bit later, but the kids really enjoy it and they get so much out of it. Um, but we do have a variety of events um, throughout the year that really, I think, brighten, you know, brighten their spirits, brighten their, their current situations. Um, you know, I, we can go into a lot of reasons why people become homeless. Um, there's a huge spike right now in terms of domestic violence, um, people becoming homeless in terms of domestic violence. And I do wanna say that I really did, I saw your photos um, in the subway stations, and I really appreciate them. I think it forces us as New Yorkers to look at who we think is homeless and how we think pe homeless people live. On top of that, I do want to say that um, the majority of our folks in, who are homeless in New York City are actually families with children. A huge number right now, so we have a population of 57,000 people in the sheltering system. 
24,000 of them are children. So you can see that it's not quite 50%, it's very close to 50% of homeless people are actually children under the age of 18. Um, they're, they're with their families, but they are um, affected very much differently than you know, single adults. Um, they're affected differently than their own parents. Um, so I think that in terms of what DHS is trying to do is really help people to understand what homelessness looks like, who these people are, where they come from. They really can be, and it's, it's interesting in terms of the, when I do go to these events, I'm often meeting the shelter group there. Um, and very often I can't tell which kids are my kids and which kids are other, another group's kids. Um, so I just, I think, you know, in terms of compassion, that's something that we really need to increase awareness of, of how, um, how, how homeless people, you know, the situations that they've come from and that they're currently in. Um, so I feel a little bit like I'm preaching to the choir because I'm assuming that most of us have that compassionate aspect and that's why we've come here today to speak to that. But I think in any instance where you can help people to understand what um, homelessness looks like in New York City, I, you know, we all would really appreciate that and they would appreciate that as well. Thanks very much. Um, so before we begin uh, substantive discussion, I just wanted to say something about format. As I said before, we'd like to, as much as possible, get something interactive going among the panelists and between uh, the audience and the panelists. So um, if while somebody is, uh, 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 I'm going to direct questions to the panelists and then, uh, or pick up on points that they've made. Um, and uh, if you want to respond to that point, just raise your hand and I'll see it. I'll mark it down and then you don't have to keep it up, okay? Um, and, uh, and then when the, uh, you know, the panelists have finished making their points, I'll, um, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll, you know, I'll go to you in the audience, okay? Um, and if I miss you somehow, I'll, I'll uh, make sure to uh, ask if anybody has any questions. But the idea is to really tr try and feel as comfortable as possible just interacting with us and not just having us be up here, as I said, as talking heads and you know you sitting there um, waiting for a Q and A session because uh, we probably won't have a Q and A session if if it all works, okay? Um, so um, so we thought um, you know uh, that uh, given more arts mission and and the SVA setting. Uh, we thought it would be appropriate to focus on um, what art as art can bring to responding to uh, the problem of homelessness and how it can be useful. I mean, really, not just talk about ideas in some kind of abstract way, but to really talk about the usefulness of art uh, in different ways um, for, um, uh, for uh, responding to um, homelessness. Um, and uh, one question that um, occurred to me is that each art has particular uh, elements to it that make that art distinct from other arts. Um, I, was, I was thinking about it in particular when, at the beginning of the video, when uh, such care was paid attention to the kind of camera, for example, that was being used, you know, and how that might be important uh, in, um, uh, in, 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 uh, in uh, photography as an art uh, in regards to making uh, photography useful. Uh, as, a, uh, as a form uh, to advocate for homeless people. So um, we have tonight a panelist from uh, the Theater of the Oppressed, um, and we have Andres Serrano in the, in, the, uh, in the audience. So let me begin by asking, um, what is it about theater? Um, you know, uh, and, and what is it about photography uh, that makes them useful, uh, in perhaps in distinct ways, um, given the e nature of each art in, in advocating for homeless people and maybe in helping us develop policies to address homeless people. You were talking, for example, about the legislative. Mm -hmm. uh, um, so um, well, I, think, I think theater is, is, is so much like photography in that there's, we're holding up a, a mirror to, to everybody saying, this is what's happening. You, you can't walk by this anymore. This is what's happening. And with Theater of the Oppressed in particular, um, in terms of usefulness, we're trying to create tools to combat what's happening. Um, in one of our shows, uh, Housing Circus, for instance, that, that I, I had the pleasure of working with Maji on, um, it was, the Housing Circus was about the, uh, uh, the craziness, which is the sort of, um, not the shelter system, but the like Section 8 and, and the next step, which is like 
uh, temporary housing and, and all, this, all the sort of rigmarole, the circus that you have to go through, all the paperwork that needs to happen and all the, the um, going appointments. to- uh, All the appointments. Can you talk a little bit about the- Oh yeah, it was um, the housing circus. I played the juggler and you know, when you're in the shelter and you're looking for housing, these social workers, they, you know, they need paperwork to you know, get you um, your own apartment. So basically, um, I, had, I had to go keep up my appointments. I had to keep up with my doctor's appointment, uh, my counseling appointment. I had to get documents, uh, criminal records, uh, medical records. And, you know, it's a deadline. And, you know, then you, you know, you're, you're walking around with your documents in your, in your backpack all day long, all week long. And once you take one letter out, that letter sets you back. Uh, maybe a whole month back because you're missing a document and basically it's like you know jumping off hoops through hoops just to meet up with these deadlines and I played the juggler I had to keep up with my appointments get documents and also I was juggling personality because sometimes it's not enough that you have your documents and that you know you know you're a woman you know it's not enough you have to you know, appeal to the person that's taking care of your case. Make sure they're having, they're having a good day. Make sure they're, they're, they're feeling good so that your file can go well as well. Because, you know, you're, you're juggling attitudes too, personalities, documents, time, schedules. So we called it the housing circus, and I played the juggler. <coughs> and, and, we're creating, um, and we're creating, there's a hand right there, um, first hand. Do we, do we do it like right now or do you No, no, like... no, no, make your point and then we'll Okay, this is great. Um, so, uh, so we're creating tools like, hey, audience member who gets up on stage who might take Maji's place, not as a victim blading, blaming thing, they take the protagonist's point of view, the person facing the problems, not as like a, if you just try harder and just pull yourself up by your bootstraps, you'll get what you need. We, we, we create the play so that it's stacked on all different layers, the system, we show the system to be oppressive to this person, so that they have to try to uh, get what they need as an education thing, as a as like a if you are in this place, if you end up in this place, as as you were talking about all these families and all, all these people who are ending up in in this situation, you've got to know this. Everyone's got to know this information first of all. Second of all, if you're in that situation, what tools? You know, pe usually the, the the first person who gets up on stage tries to be nice. And just tries to do it, handle it in like a way that's gonna. Well, if you just see my humanity, everything's gonna be okay. And we train our actors that to fight, to push back the, yeah. the way it is, the way the real life, the real world is. So that person inevitably is like, you know, <laughs> brushed aside and no, and, and and they learn. And then by the end, there's a fierce dialogue about human rights, and there and there's people are, are 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 fiercely fighting for what they deserve as human. I was just. I also work. Uh, do a troop at the Alley Forney Center, which provides services for uh, LGBTQ uh, homeless youth. Uh, about forty percent of the youth, homeless youth in the city, are LGBT um, Q, and uh, they're apparently uh, another organization wanted to come and do do theater with the youth, and it was really interesting because they this pointing at your, your question, they wanted to get their stories and then have the actors portray their stories on stage. And, I, and it was really interesting, sort of, this, this question of, well, the actors are on stage representing their own, their own work rather than taking this, these stories and presenting them as, you know, I'm, we're showing their, their, we're showing it rather than living it. And then the next step of interacting. I think there is a kind of sense at the beginning of our shows of an othering. There is kind of like a, oh crap, I'm in the audience and I'm watching this and I know at the end they're gonna ask us to get up on stage and this is really, but we, we take them in slow, we take it slowly mm -hmm. and, and, and play games and, and through up. humor and warm up and everyone goes, oh, this is not this, like what you're saying, there's not this otherness. It's an interesting thing you bring up. Could I just follow up on that question about what you mean by gaze? And I think I have some idea, but I was wondering if uh, Mr. Serrano would want to respond to that point or anybody else about photography as 
um, as, a, as, a, as a, a gaze, if you would elaborate on that a little bit first. And, uh, well, I, I was struck by the idea that, uh, you, you know, that, that uh, you, you said photography is voyeuristic. I find photography to be meaningless a lot of times. In this uh, media of social media and everyone Facebooking and Instagramming crap, I mean real crap, there's so much images now being created about meaningless things, things that matter only to a small number of people. And my intent in doing my show was to put pictures that mattered to me on these posters, on these walls that I pass through every day. And I'm tired of being sold something that I don't want to buy. And I find a lot of people are tired of it. And so I wanted to pay homage to the people that I wanted to pay homage to. And, and I didn't want to call them homeless because that's a cliche. And so I call them residents of New York because mm. they are residents. Whether or not you like it, they live with us and they're among us and they're part of us. Mm. And so my, I was just intending to pay homage to the people that I see on the street every day. And it's funny because at some point someone, well, when more <coughs> put up the installation, there was a couple of posters that said, listed all the donors and all the homeless. And someone said, he saw hundreds of names and he said, oh, these are the donors? I said, no, those are the homeless. Heidi, I, I saw you taking notes. Did you want to s I respond? Actually, I'm glad you said it because I think the, the thing that really struck me um, was the title, The Residents of New York. Um, again, the homeless, I think we don't always know what that looks like. Um, and we assume we know what it looks like. We assume, you know, the guy digging in the trash can, that's what we see. There was also an amazing article um, that was very shocking, I can say, to my agency. Last year it was written by Andrea Elliott in the New York Times called The Invisible Child. Um, the title of that was extremely accurate. The fact that she was invisible, this is what homelessness looks like. Um, a child living in the shelter system is what it looks like. Um, and we tend to forget that. We tend to remember what we see. Um, and on a regular basis, I'm, people speak to me um, as if this is all that homelessness is. It's, it's just what they're seeing um, when there really is a whole backstory. And it's so true that it's residents of New York, that it's people who couldn't pay their rent. Um, it's not always because of drug addiction or because of um, a, you know, a choice that they actively made. It's very often uh, inability to pay rent, um, wage stagnation. Um, in the face of these skyrocketing rental prices and you know lack of affordable housing. Um, so in terms of also bridging that back to legislators, affordable housing right now I think is the number one thing that the city really needs in order to solve the crisis that we're in at the moment. Um, I don't know if it's too early to bring this up as well, but I wanted to also say that um, especially with Free Arts NYC, we, um, what happens is Free Arts NYC basically partners with a, a corporation. The corporation sponsors the day, but they also have um, volunteers from that corporation partner one-on-one -on -one with our kids. So we bring, let's say, 50 kids for one day. They bring 50 volunteers from an actual corporation. And that may be three, four hours of interaction between our kids and uh, someone who has an amazing job um, probably doesn't live in the same neighborhood that our kids live in, that the shelter is in. Um, it crosses all these socioeconomic lines, it crosses racial lines, it crosses, um, I can say, gender, uh, traditional gender lines. Um, the kids get an exposure to what the adults do in terms of jobs, which maybe they haven't seen those types of mentors or role models. And I, that's the reason I really love Free Arts. So, you know, we do a lot of events with a lot of different partners, but Free Arts I really love, especially the socioeconomic and the racial lines, because I think that's the biggest barrier that we face in having people understand um, what homelessness looks like. It's very much, you know, what you just mentioned earlier, the othering of someone. Um, so I, that's my absolute favorite thing, and, and bringing people into the fold and realizing that they are residents of New York. They're not just some distant other. Um, this this um, discussion uh, for me raises the, the point about the importance of the art being public art um, and how important is that? Um, because you know, we could produce art 
that relates to homelessness in one way or another, uh, in, um, and we do, uh, that is more, um, uh, less, certainly less public than, for example, um, Mr. Serrano's uh, photography. And so there's this issue of, you know, you know if you have, uh, of, of, you know, how important is it that it be public, um, and, and in what ways should it be public uh, in order to be a useful as a, as, a, as a tool, you know, as I said, to advocate for homeless people? Um, you know, what do we get out of it being uh, public? Uh, as opposed to, you know, in a gallery, per, for example, you know, um, uh, where you have to enter into a space, or maybe, you know, in a theater where you have to enter into that space as opposed to just experiencing it, you know, kind of, uh, as you say, is walking through the, you know, your, um, you know, places that you normally walk through and then you, you know, you encounter it. So I was wondering if anybody had any thoughts about, about this, you know, the importance of the public in, pub in, in public art as a as a tool, you know, and and how how does that how do you think that works as a tool? I remember um, last year we performed in Dumbo Arts Festival, and it was in the public, and we were doing our from theater, and people were walking outside, outside yeah. and people were walking by, and some were busy, some were interested, but those that stayed got to learn that this could happen to them a shift in their life could happen and they could be in our shoes. So they came up to us, talked to us, collected pamphlets, got curious with Theatre of the Oppressed, joined Theatre of the Oppressed, volunteered, and from there we expanded. And now John Leo is doing like three bottles. So it's very important to bridge art together, connect with people that are not familiar with the situation and inform them empower them, enlighten them, and um, encourage them to join in. And, and, right. um, and, and the idea of, and that's more easily achieved uh, if you can make it as public as possible. Yes, right. public is very essential. Right, right. Yeah, engaging, I mean, ticket prices are, I mean, the rents in this, the rents in this town are too high. I can't afford to go to the theater. It's like, it's crazy. Um, the um, uh, one of the one of the um, well, let me uh, I'm, let me just go back to the um, the question about the art as as art is that um, you know I was wondering about I, I just you know um, art tries to sometimes uh, uh, pr create beautiful objects. Um, it tries to create interesting objects, you know, as art. Um, it may try to dis create disturbing objects as art. Um, and um, I was wondering, especially since we have all these uh, art students here in the audience um, who try to do one or more of those things in your work um, and other things besides, um, and, um, and perhaps, you know, um, you know those uh, some of those elements are, are, are elements of what you, you know you do in your in theater uh, or in photography, um, and I was wondering if you had any thoughts about you know you know trying to trying to be you know trying to create beautiful objects, trying to create uh, interesting objects, trying to create um, disturbing objects. You know um, how that um, could be useful. Again, I keep coming back to this word useful because I kind of wanted. To, um, we want to emphasize that you know this is trying to make you know we're trying to discuss art not you know in a way that um, directly ta speaks to uh, advocating for the homeless um, and not um, not just you know as art itself but but there are these things that art tries to do and I was wondering if anybody had thought about you know what these you know trying to do these achieve these things beauty you know disturbing uh, uh, images whatever uh, how that could uh, how that might have an impact on um, on you know trying to uh, advocate for homelessness um, I don't know can I just say yeah about the difference between doing this in a public okay. Uh, okay. project okay. and in a gallery in my case I would get slammed for it. You put a big price on it, but my work goes for you know a certain amount of money. You put a, put a big price on it in the gallery, uh, yeah, and people are like, 
Well, he's exploiting the poor. Now, it doesn't matter that I paid him. It doesn't matter that in addition to the money that I got through more art, I spent 10 grand on my own that I never re recovered. And it doesn't matter that at the time that I did that, I, I did it knowing I, I owed 100 grand to the feds for taxes that I didn't have. So it doesn't matter that I was in a big shithole when I did that project. I did it because I felt, as an artist, I gotta do what I gotta do. Uh, but you put it in the gallery, in my case, and they accuse me of all kinds of things. They accuse me of things anyway, whether or not they're true or not. They accuse me of all kinds of things. So that's a difference, and I was glad that I was able to do it in a public project. I'm actually having a show in Brussels, a big museum show next year, and the director uh, of, of that museum liked the, hom the, the homeless project so much that I did here. He wants me to do a residence of Brussels. There, there are residents in Paris. There's people homeless all over. And so for me, it's better to do it in a public setting rather than to put a price tag on it because someone's always going to slam me for that. Well, the price tag also, I would think, um, there's a price tag, as you said, about kind of, you know, uh, a, a price tag of entrance into more private spaces. Like, you know, even if it's in a gallery, um, you know, there are a lot of people who don't go to galleries. And, and, and they also have a sense that if you go to a gallery, you know, there is going to be a price tag on the object. And so, you know, people are supposed to be able to afford those things are the ones who should, should go there. Um, and, um, and the kind of conversation that you're going to have, I walked by your work with some friends. Um, I think it was after one of our shows, actually, and we were walking by and we had a different conversation than we would have had on the subway because right. we had to engage with it. It was right there. We had, we had to walk by it and, whoa, that's not a Nike ad. Mm -hmm. like, that's, whoa, what's going on? And with the iPhone, wow, cool. people, I got a lot of press, but with the iPhone and, you know, social media, people in different countries see it, you know? And so uh, it, it, it's a good thing because it's, it gets a lot more traffic more exposure than in a gallery. Right? And it really is accessible to all. Like It's accessible to the art world. It's accessible to non-artists. And I think that a lot of artists doing social practice work where they're working with communities kind of get um, slammed a little bit because <coughs> they're making work that is inaccessible to the art world. So I think this is one like really particular project that does that. But I, um, I'm interested in, in what is being said about um, breaking these cliches of homelessness. I kind of want to go back to that if we can. Mm -hmm. But the way that um, Mr. Serrano's piece is doing that by, by titling and, and just trying to untangle like what does homelessness mean? It's like someone without a house, right? Um, but I'm also curious, we're talking about um, being visible and invisible at the same time. And I think that you mentioned something I wanted to go back to. What you said, you were being stared at, but then you were invisible. And I want to like talk about that experience, <coughs> and how those two things can coexist, how someone can stare, and also um, stigmatize in a way that makes someone feel um, invisible. Me? Yeah. I, I, when you said that, oh, I invisible. A little more, and I also, but yeah. I also wanted to know what. Um, Mr. Sharana's, what is your response been from like when people see those photographs? Like, what are they? Is it grotesque? Is it beautiful? Like, what have you been hearing from people? Well, I got a positive response. It was basically, really positive. Uh, people like seeing them, and people who notice it because you know, in the subway, that train station, it's it's. You're competing for attention. People are not looking. They're, they're going through the trains, so they're not looking and paying attention to those stupid ads that they ignore all the time. But every now and then, you get somebody who looked, and they're like, "Oh wow, this is different. Let me take a look. To, to, let me take a, a moment to look at this." So, uh, I, I got a very positive response. A, a lot of people liked it. You know? uh, Maji, before you answer the, the question, I just I just wanted to pick up on something that John said in response. Uh, uh, you know, walking, having a different kind of conversation. Um, about public, you know, in particular Mr. Serrano's, but perhaps public art in general uh, regarding homelessness, which is that instead of having the consumer conversation, which is what the ad in that space would have encouraged, you had a, you know, a kind of a socially conscious conversation. I mean, it, it, it affects the, you know, we're so used to having the, the consumer conversation in this society so, so much, so often. Um, everything around us, around us con, you know, encourages us to have the consumer conversation as opposed to the uh, socially conscious conversation. And so, 
you know, this kind of public art, um, one of the ways I think it kind of, kind of, kind of affects taking off on what John was saying about his own experience is that it, it affects the conversation that you have with friends and with other people. So you don't, you know, you don't talk about the, the latest, you know, sneaker or, or iPhone or something like that. But um, uh, Maji, and then we have somebody from the audience, so. Yeah, what is homeless? How do you describe homelessness? What is that definition? Is it safe to say if your name is not on the deed, if your name is not on a deed of a house of a mortgage, if your name is not on a mortgage, then guess what, you're homeless. Because if you have an apartment, you could get kicked out and go to a friend's house or a family's house. So if your name is not in a mortgage, you're practically homeless. You know, and to, that's my definition. So when you're not part of something, when your name is not in that mortgage, you, you become like um, outcast. I mean, you become, you, you don't have a voice, a platform. Um, um, to, you know, I felt invisible because I wasn't part of anything. I was somewhere else. I was part of, I was part of nature. I was a tree growing, giving oxygen, giving shade to people but people ignoring me. I was that tree, surrounding people with love, but people didn't want the love that I, they would park their bikes around me, throw the garbage around me, because I wasn't even there, but I was there. I was living uh, like across the street from Central Park. I was in a car, so um, Central Park was my home. And then I was in a shelter. Now, now become the shelter becomes a battlefield. Now you gotta, now you gotta protect yourself. Now you're in war. I mean, how is it that you're in a shelter and you have security guards, and people could come inside your room, rob you, leave with, with your merchandise, and the security guard is just you know, on their iPhone, on Facebook. And then you call the police, and I don't know if I went too off, did I answer your question? No, but you've brought this up a lot about accountability of, of staff, really. And you mentioned before that um, you're a juggler because your caseworker might have a bad day, and that could affect you, that could affect My you. whole life, yes. So I would ask Heidi to respond to that a little bit because we're talking about the oppressive system here and kind of like making that visual and understandable. And Heidi works for DHS, I'm wondering like what kind of self-critical mechanisms or what, you know, how can like you respond to, to this problem? Sure, so I would first ask Maji, how, when was it that you were in the shelter? Oh, I was in the shelter since, uh, let me see, this 2012. Okay, so I think, I will say, I think a lot of it has changed. A lot of people think about it from the 80s. Um, no, people, I, I'm sorry, but, but let <laughs> I me, hear this all the no, time. No, I understand that, I'm, yeah. I'm, let me just so, answer. Yeah. So I think a lot of people think about it as in terms of the 80s, in terms of you know these large, even in terms of families entering the shelter system, people think that it's large congregate rooms where there's a bunch of um, cots. Um, some of them are set up like that. There is a men's shelter in Manhattan that is set up that way, where there is about, I don't know, 50 men maybe, or 25 men in one room. Um, other shelters are set up that there is maybe a room with eight people in them. Other shelters are set up for adult families where there's two people in one room, so they're a couple in one room. Um, there's all kinds of configurations of a shelter. Families with children, they always have their own room. We can't mix a family with a single side, for instance. Um, there are security at the shelters. I definitely think there are instances where um, security guards don't do what they're supposed to do. Um, and we, what happens is, we can go back to what John was mentioning earlier. We rely a lot on our elected officials to kind of bring those instances to us. So if Maji has an in a problem or if another shelter resident has a problem, if first the first step is to go to the caseworker. If the caseworker is not responsive, they can go to the shelter director. If that person is not responsive, like you mentioned earlier, that, that juggling. Yeah. Um, and I think that is definitely a, um, a huge issue for a lot of families. Um, especially families who have many, many children because each child has different situations. But it gets to the point um, where the elected officials become aware. I deal a lot directly every single day. I hear complaints every single day from elected officials in regards to um, clients in the shelter, outside, unsheltered clients. 
um, who you know bring different issues to our office, and we really try to resolve that as quickly as possible, as thoroughly as possible. We do have kind of um, safety nets and catch-alls for situations like that. Um, I don't know if I need to go into all those. No, things. I think I, that's fine. I, I don't think we want to have a discussion about the you know the the the, the, the problems of, of shelters. But there's a woman here, and then we'll go along. Yeah. So I'm sorry. The, <laughs> um, I feel like there's a pretty question that needs to be asked in the conversation about public art, which is what we mean when we say public. So I would actually really strongly disagree with the statement that putting something in public is accessible to all. I mean, public space is incredibly coded. I mean, we work with communities of kids who won't cross a neighborhood boundary. And so I think, especially when you're doing sort of participatory art, you have to be really careful about that. Because there is always an audience. You don't just get to put something out there and then say it's for everybody. You know, you're visioning something for someone, um, and I think that's an important choice to be aware of. Um, Belgi touched on a number of issues of that juggling that I really responded to. I think many in the community at large who would like to engage with the issue of homelessness are themselves, you know, on that very, very, very thin margin between, as you, as you mentioned, of having a roof over their head and, and not. And the, the question that I want to throw out is how to deal with both breaking down the barriers to becoming engaged, but also creating enough of a boundary so that you protect your own people. And I will say publicly, I'm a lucky people who lives in affordable housing and has that precious Section 8 voucher. Well, if I invite somebody into my home, I gotta report it immediately, three days or something, to some entity somewhere. And if that person and, and then they they adjust my voucher and I could leave it, lose it. And then if that person leaves, I have to uh, report it again and prove that they're somewhere. And if I can't, I never get back. Anyway, I don't want to get into the specifics of it. But there are a lot of ways in which somebody might want to invite someone to their table once a week, or use their shower, or whatever, or, or participate in an art thing. And there are, there are funny barriers, not just one's own psychological but barriers, but institutional barriers towards not endangering one's own situation. I mean, it raises an interesting question about how, you know, uh, you'll forgive me for being a social scientist for a second, um, and um, uh, of how you um, use art to, uh, to make people aware of or make arguments about the, 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 what you're talking about is the structural conditions, you know, the, the lack of income in, that Heidi mentioned, income stagnation, you know. Um, uh, Maji said, you know, you know, your your rent went up and your income stayed the same, you know. Um, and how how do you use um, how can art, you know? Um, I think that's the question you're asking. How can art um, uh, uh, kind of make us aware of these structural conditions as opposed to the people who are the uh, you know who, whose lives are affected negatively by those structured conditions? Is that a, a fair yeah, a fair statement? Yeah. Um, can I express yeah, something? Yes, yeah, please. I would like to express that um, all my friends are all, are all artists, all of them. Musicians, singers, painters. And I noticed that sometimes when you lose your job, you become an entrepreneur. I see my friends on the trains singing, doing poetry, doing baskets, selling those baskets, uh, and not losing their mind. Art is a way to stay grounded, to stay focused, productive, and positive. You can lose your mind easily when they take your dignity, but we as artists found an outlet to express that hardship and um, so that people could see and um, learn from. So art is, is, a, is, a, is a powerful force to stay positive and to become an entrepreneur if you should 
lose your job. You now you're forced to have your talents and your God-given gifts to survive in this planet. You may not have you 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 know everything could be taken from you, but they can't take away your talent. They cannot take away your gifts. You're born with that. You could sit in a corner and put wires together and make earrings, and somebody might like it, and somebody might buy it, and now your art is custom made for that individual. As working for a non-for-profit, we constantly are thinking about funding, and as time has gone on, <clears throat> we have seen, particularly in, you know, social service type of uh, work, so um, working with children on sports and fitness, working with children on art, working with adults on art, is that we're getting asked those questions of how do you prove whether or not your program works? And you're like, you know, there's so many factors to take into account. So what we do as an organization the past couple of years is we've set goals. So I was talking a little bit about providing that safe space for children to express themselves. That for us is a goal. And we put it out there when we do our funding and say, this is one of the biggest things for us, is that, yes, we want the children to be able to, for a cooking program, they know how to peel, or for sports, they know how to do dribbling basketball, for arts that they know the different mediums they can use in order to express themselves. That stuff is great and it's important, because um, we are saying that we're trying to teach them some things, but we're also saying, this is also another goal for us, and how do we measure that? How many times do they come back to the program? Do they engage with other children? If they are you know, acting out in the beginning, how are they progressing as time goes on? And we did work with Free Arts and Creative Arts Workshop as the other ones that we actually consulted with and say, you know, putting it out to the funding world, listen, it's not just about what they're learning, it's also how they are feeling, and it's about how they are expressing themselves, and that is just as important as whether or not they can answer something on a worksheet for a test. Um, I get mixed reactions. Some of, the, some of the funders are like into it and they're like, okay, you know, the funding streams are small, but they're definitely increasing. And some of the funders are not, it's just not their, it's not what they're into right now. So we're, we're seeing, I'll be honest, we're seeing more movement along the health and wellness fitness line. So talking about cooking, talking about nutrition, talking about sports. That is resonating with people right now for different, I think for different reasons. Some of it's national, some of it's local, but I do feel like the arts is still in there and we're still advocating for it and saying it's just as important. And when you, I went through the New York City public school system and I benefited from music, I benefited from dance, theater, all those things helped me make, helped me be a success in life. And I was like, it's our goal as an organization to kind of start filling those gaps that the children are not getting at public schools anymore because there's been so much regiment towards education and testing, um, which is you know, part of our world, but not the only thing. Right. Do you see or, ha or can you make an argument about the relationship between art and health and these issues that, um, you know, that, uh, that, you know, that people seem to be moving in the direction of, or did they just, you know, is it, because it would seem to me that, that you know, both, um, uh, as you said, it's kind of emotionally and psychologically healthy for um, for your children, I assume, to be doing art in a um, to ex be expressing themselves. I mean, to my mind, uh, and I was I was eventually going to bring you into the conversation. Don't worry. It was that um, that, and this speaks to Maji's experience too. Is that what what's happening in the arts um, uh, in in both of your experiences is that you're allowing people or helping people express themselves in a structured way. It's not just, you know, it's not just kind of, um, you know, art basically, there are, there are rules to doing art, right? Uh, whatever the art is. Um, there are, you know, there are methods. And so, so there's a structured way that, that, um, that uh, your children or Maji through acting, you know, l learn to express themselves. And so I was wondering if, um, how, how important that structuring of the, you know, uh, through art is for your children. And for, the, for the children, I would say yes. I would say any program, our experience has been any program where we can provide a little bit more structure. It doesn't have to be regimented. It doesn't have to be, you have to do these things in certain orders. But as long as we're giving the people who are leading the programs and the kids that are participating some guidelines <coughs> and structures so that when they get to that point where 
honestly, there are a lot of volunteers who get into the room with a child who is living in a shelter and they don't know what to do. It is, you know, they're not, it's not part of their world. It's something that they, they're here to hopefully, you know, make things better um, for that child for a couple of hours, but they're definitely, we've seen it plenty of times. There's kind of like, oh God, I'm here. What am I going to do? Providing some of that structure definitely helps both of them to forge a relationship and hopefully work together to express for the child or sometimes the adult um, to express themselves in a way they might not have been able to in any other capacity. So structure is important. It shouldn't be rigid, but it definitely is providing a framework helps them. The art itself. Mm -hmm. And I have a great example of this mm -hmm. um, and, and funding that you're talking about um, at the Alley Forney Center with, uh, with the LGBTQ homeless youth. Um, we uh, typically, when we started there, we got in the door through like HIV prevention, because that's where like all the money is coming from, right? They're like, let's try to let's try to get these youth not to uh, spread HIV. So, um, and I found, and we kind of got a sense of that, like that was where the funding was coming from, because when we asked them what their story was, what's your story, they would typically say, um, I need to wear a condom and um, this and this and that, and it was like, no, no, what's your story? Like, you could tell where the funding was coming because all day, all the groups they've been in have been about HIV prevention. And we were like, no, this isn't school. <laughs> like, what are you really thinking? Like, I know these people are telling you, like, what's going on? And uh, typically, we've been there now for three years, and their stories are coming out, and are coming out fiercely. And they're starting to do their sh th these stories for city council people. And the, the leadership there, again, the people with the, the access to the money and the resources, um, one of them, uh, during one of the, sh right after the shows, came up to me, sort of, he hadn't seen the show yet. He was like one of these upper people. And he said, how do you get them to stay? Like the people who are on stage with you right now, who, are, who have come to rehearsal, to make a show, it, it, it's like it takes, 10 weeks of rehearsal coming every week. Those people that you have, like that person right there, we can't get them the services that they need at all. Like they will not, hold, they will not go to appointments. And, and this person is like one of the most committed people. And I think it goes back to um, what the gentleman in the front was talking about, um, or their, the, the source of the problem. Um, and it also someone was talking about um, art that's pretty, you know, beautiful. Like I think it actually is about truth and anger. Like I think it's about like speaking something that needs to be spoken so bad that that it's not gonna keep, it's gonna help you survive yeah. day to day. And I think that might be something if you're all artists out there that you might relate to um, as an artist. Um, and so now when we go to AFC, it's not the question isn't about like where can we get the funding from the HIV and the da da da. It's they're they're. They're gonna get it from wherever, but th these these clients are committed to. Come. They're asking them now, when when is Theory of the Press gonna be back? Because I, I saw their show and I have a story to tell. Well, my answer would be you should volunteer. <laughs> that is my answer. Um, where? Uh, well, you can come volunteer with us, and then there's many different avenues we work with. You know. 1,300 partners a year, and each of them have different missions, and some of them have very, some of them work primarily with homeless uh, adults and children, some of them work with people living with HIV and AIDS, seniors, I mean, there's definitely a, met, you know, a huge menu for you to choose from, and the way our model works is you honestly can go to a project one time and say, this is not for me, and then try something else. Um, and we definitely see people who develop relationships um, with clients and they choose that that becomes their agency they're loyal to it and they choose to volunteer with that agency on their own not through us I mean we've definitely seen some great great relationships we've developed over the years um, and yes I mean we probably do provide a bit of a buffer because we are the ones who work directly with the agency and we're providing them the ability to manage volunteers because most people who most nonprofits that would want to work with volunteers more, very rarely it's their only job. They usually have four other jobs that they're responsible for, and this is like the bottom of the totem pole. And we go to them and say, 
we'll get you the manpower, we'll provide you the funding to run the program, you just have to agree to have somebody there to actually oversee and then deal with the client recruitment. And yes, we have people who are trained to come and lead the new volunteers and kind of get them comfortable and you can definitely do that that way. So that's our app, that's a way we provide you know, a way into these different types of worlds that they, people might not gain access to in any other way. For us, I would say not formally. I would say the one place where it kind of has developed over the years is honestly through our education program. So we definitely have been actively <coughs> thinking about the idea of providing we have an SAT program, and basically the goal of that program is to provide the type of education tutoring and help um, that you would get if you paid for Kaplan. That's our goal. And we've been running that program for years, and then from that program, we've been doing things other ways. So, you know, we're trying to help them as sophomores and gain some of the education knowledge they would need in order to do better on the SATs. We provide FAFSA. Um, work, FAFSA um, pre preparation so that kids who do well in the SATs help them figure out, okay, I could actually apply for these co for certain colleges and get them into the system. We are in the process of figuring out whether or not we want to start working with freshmen, if we want to actually you know, stay working with these students through college, maybe after college. So that's what we've been doing. I'd say on the younger levels, not, not quite yet. We haven't really... We don't have access to um, the children in the sense of we're recruiting with them and we're inter you know we're we're keeping track of their families. We don't, that's not something we are doing. We rely on the partner to do it that way. Um, so we know naturally that there are kids who go to multiple programs of our things and really benefit from it. But there's no, that's kind of not what we're doing. And it would make it would make us a very very different organization if we said we were going to start doing that. So right now, that's not the plan, but through the, in the high school age is where we've been doing, just, it just kind of organically developed, and now we're gonna try to be a little bit more structured about it. So, I, I mean, I don't think there's really anything targeted at our kids specifically. You know, there's the school system-wide anti-bullying campaign. I hear that a lot, um, you know, from our kids that so-and-so is <coughs> bullied. They're always talking about bullies. I don't know if it's always from personal experience or if this is just something that, you know, the teachers are kind of drilling into their head at the moment. Um, I do think, I, so I lived in South Africa for a few years, um, and coming from South Africa, not directly after apartheid, but not too long after it either. Um, how segregated it is, it sometimes reminds me. New York is very similar in some ways. Um, neighborhoods, boroughs, especially neighborhoods are very segregated. Um, you know, the, the kids, where they come from and then where the shelters are, that it's not a surprise that they're in poor neighborhoods. Um, it is a surprise, for instance, when there's a shelter on the west side um, and they get a lot of that pushback. We get a lot of pushback from politicians, but also politicians because the communities are pushing back um, on those politicians. Um, and I think it kind of harkens back to the um, comment that was made earlier that I, would I don't have an answer for, but I would love for anyone to you know, continue that conversation of talking about the prevention aspects of it and criticizing the structure that exists um, that creates homelessness. Um, I think the one place in New York City that is kind of all things being equal is the subway system. Almost everybody has to take the subway system. Maybe not the extremely rich, um, but it is one place that you know different people from different races, different socioeconomic groups mix a lot. Um, so maybe art should be directed towards the subway system or on be, be visible in the subway system. Um, but I think in terms of the prevention and criticizing, you know, the lack of affordable housing and wages and all of those things that create homelessness, I think that would be um, very useful as well. Well, let me just pick up on this business of the structure, you know, art and, you know, and somehow influencing the conversation about the structural conditions. Um, and I was thinking of, to try and make it more concrete, I was thinking like what, what kind of art or what art could be uh, 
know, kind, I mean, in a very broad sense, could be um, produced that could affect um, politicians and policymakers, since those are the people, since they, unlike, unlike um, Susan, for example, who works with, you know, kind of, these are the conditions that you have, and so you're working within those conditions in order to, um, uh, you know, have, have, use art to help these kids express themselves um, in ways that are important to them as individuals and are useful to them and, and help their lives. Um, but politicians don't do that. They don't run programs, right? They, um, they pass laws, they make rules and regulations, whatever, that people have to live by. And so I was thinking about the structured, this, you know, making art to affect the structural conditions issue. Um, it, one way to think about it is what kind of art uh, can, and again, I mean art kind broadly, um, could, could we imagine um, might actually affect uh, these policymakers and politicians uh, directly? I mean, uh, is it, you know, is it, you know, is, is, is it public art, for example? Is that, in, you know, an important criteria? Uh, is it to make people feel, um, um, you know, uh, the point before about um, making things uh, all positive, you know, rather than to, to kind of create disturbing art, you know, or is it to make beautiful art? I, I don't know. I'm just saying, like, what, what can we do, uh, you know, what can you do as artists and the art you produce um, to affect policymakers uh, and so that they might want to actually, you know, change the structural conditions, you know? I mean, it's a tough question, I, I, I grant. Please. Uh, I think anything that embarrasses a public politician, mm -hmm. anything that gets uh, media attention, scrutiny, you know, they don't want to be shamed. So they only act when they're called upon to act. And if you put enough pressure on them through, through media, through, not even social media, th th through actual media, so, you know, that's when they do something. You know, they do something to save face, to say they're doing something. But if they're not, if no one uh, calls attention to it, if no one, you know, calls them on it, they're going to ignore it. So you have to shame them into doing things. Well, that's one approach, but what, what would you say about that with your legislative change? Yeah, I was, gonna, I was just about to say, they, 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 they are also moved to change by being able to, like, shake hands with a bunch of people who experience homelessness and a bunch of people who are, who are um, moved to engage with it. There's a hand right there. Um, and, and, and then engage with the, the, the plays and make change. Um, Augusta Boal, who was the person who pioneered Theater of the Oppressed in Brazil, um, for years, uh, after he'd been uh, kicked out of Brazil for a while, he came back and then made laws for like five years using this stuff, using, make, doing a play in, chamber, in the chambers, here's a proposal, this is what it would look like, the audience engages with it. No, no that, that's not going to work. We, let's do it this way. And actually acting it out, role, role playing. You know, how you would do some sort of training in a in a corporate setting. That kind. That's a sort of so you can sort of envision. I wish we could show a video or something. But they, um, and then the politician goes, Oh, okay. That in the real world, it's, re it's rehearsal for life. It's not a. It's not a theater. It's not art, as you were talking about, like um, art. It's it's actually trying things out. Um, and then taking that to, you know, like um, the first festival we had was about uh, around homeless youth, um, particularly LGBT homeless youth, and the um, the amount of beds that are that are there's like something like eighty beds for uh, four thousand LGBT homeless youth, uh, four, uh, 80 beds that are specifically for them. There's other places they can go that um, that aren't safe. Because if you're if you're coming if you're running away from home because you're you're trans or because you're gay you're going to go to a, a shelter where you're then going to get peed on in the night because you're trans I mean that's that this is stuff that happens you don't want to go there so you're not going to use that bed um, so the politicians who were there were like oh we do need more beds and so that 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 funding you know there's more beds this year because of that. And, and myself as an artist, because I have never experienced homelessness, and, and I came to it from, you know, a privileged, you know, and I'd say even entitled. There was a, a period of time where I felt like the person with the yellow shirt, where I was like, I, how am I gonna, like, I, I can't relate this at all. The other, ah, uh, 
but there was a, there was a, a process of, of what is it, what are their stories and my stories, where do they meet? And, and I'm finding that more and more that it is about me. It is about my experience as a resident of the city, as a, as a person who, that, with human rights and with my own, you know, my own things that piss, that, that piss me off. How does it do that? Do you know? I mean, I know that's a hard, that's a difficult question, because it, but you know, because it's kind of getting into this mysterious process of art and well, its effect. And what it I mean, I can give my opinion. I yeah, don't sure. really know, yeah, yeah, yeah. but I think from what when you hand a child, so I'm just thinking about photography projects. Like when we hand a kid a camera, we give them guidance, but. It, they're doing it themselves. It is their ability, and they decide what they're going to shoot, and they decide what they're how they're going to use a filter. They're like it's all their own decision making processes, and they're often in situations where they have no decision. I mean, you're a kid; you have little decisions, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. they're even. I feel like children who are in the shelter system have even less ability to exercise any type of decision making processes and anything to make them, you know to give them the, the ability to learn how to do those things over time. So they're not, you know, they're not going out to play. Um, they're not going out to play in school because school doesn't have recess anymore. They're not going to play after school because they have to be in their, you know, in their shelter by a certain time. Mm -hmm. If their parents are trying to keep up with appointments, that's another, like there's just so many more per, you know, ways where they're, they're not getting their opportunity to do anything. So the art is probably one medium where there's no, there are rules, but there are really no rules. They can basically do whatever they want, and they just learn over time how to use that, that particular space to learn all of those extra things that we would have we learned just because we have very different lives. That's my opinion. Uh, you asked about the question of what kinds of art might politicians respond to and might also engage in problem solving. And two things that I picked up in this, from this program. First is, again, um, you mentioned entrepreneurship. Yes. Often homeless people are quite resourceful. And as much as I like art for art's sake, if you can help somebody make the earrings that sell or some kind of tote bag that people will like, or to use their design skills to make some interesting item of clothing from something that they recycle that will sell in a boutique someplace, uh, that will do something very positive for them, and it's a kind of fundable thing. And in, in the theater arts, and this from having taught, um, I never taught theater, but I was in schools where there were kids who were not theater majors who took a course or two in theater. And what I noticed is that they became better at how they presented themselves to the world. They walked different, they, they, they could speak in a more effective way, and they became more effective when they went to their college interviews or their job interviews or had to advocate for their causes. So I think that there's also that ability to use the theater arts to simply make, help non-actors non communicate more effectively in whatever they might want to do or need to do, how to advocate for themselves in the social agencies or with their physicians or for their, when they talk to their children's teachers. Mm -hmm. um, um, we're drawing to a close, so I wanted to just ask the panel if you had any, each of you had any uh, uh, um, ending comments that you wanted to uh, leave us with. It's okay if you don't. <laughs> Come and volunteer with us. Pardon me? <laughs> Come and volunteer with us. <laughs> okay, good. Yeah. Make a pitch. <laughs> I wanted to say that, you know, this is a room filled with artists. We are artists. We should all come together and collaborate. Don't let no one stop your, your shine, you know, express yourself and also um, take this opportunity to, to um, get involved with Theater of the Oppressed, you know, and, you know, see how you fit in and, you know. Uh, yeah, too, yeah. Oh, oh yeah, but I, I don't know that organization. <laughs> <laughs> I'm speaking about my experience as an artist, yeah. talking to other fellow artists to don't let no one stop your progress to be productive and positive individuals. Thank you very much.